Students and guests, welcome to our joint seminar, Global Challenges to Development. This course is a partnership between the Global Awareness Education at the University of Tübingen in Germany, the State University of Maringá in Brazil, and the Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. In this course, we will alternate theoretical debates with the students' projects related to sustainability, education, creative industries, geopolitical instabilities, and health. We will have guests from different countries and contexts who will contribute with lecturers to these topics. In both universities, the course is offered to students of different disciplines. In Tübingen, as part of the Global Awareness Education in the Transdisciplinary Course Program, and the State University of Maringá as a free extension course. The course organizers are Professor Mauricio Weinert and Professor Sara Pichet from the State University of Maringá, Professor Roni Nagwadi, Nelson Mandela University, and me, Klausa Perez da Silva, University of Tübingen. Today, we will hear a lecture on post-development theory, a view from Africa, with Professor Sally Matthews from South Africa. Sally Matthews works in the Department of Political and International Studies at Rhodes University, where she's an associate professor and the current head of department. In this role, she teaches undergraduate and postgraduate students and supervises MA and PhD students. Her areas of teaching interest are principally in African studies, African politics, and African political economy. Her main areas of current research are development studies, specifically post-development theory and the role of NGOs, African studies, specifically questions around the decolonization of the African studies curriculum, race and identity, and the transformation of higher education. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. So thank you, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Glacia, and hello everyone. It's great to be here and to join you all virtually. I'm coming to you from Makanda in the Eastern Cape in South Africa, and I'm very glad to see those who, who I can see and very glad to see the names of those um, I can't see. Um, I'm going to share my screen now so that I'll share the presentation. I have also shared the presentation with um, your professor, so I'm happy for her to share it um, with you. Um, so let me share my screen and there we go and let me just put it on display so can i just ask are you able to see me there yeah you can see me okay so um i'm going to be giving you a, a, a an introduction to post-development theory but perhaps a little bit more um the focus will also be on just looking at post-development theory from africa because Africa has sometimes been a little neglected uh, when we think about um, post-development theory. Um, but before thinking about post-development theory, I think we first just need to think about how we define development and what we mean by development in the, in the first place. And I know um, that you're all coming from different disciplinary backgrounds, but you've all been thinking already quite a bit about this idea of development. So I know that you have been thinking quite a lot about development, but I don't have any sense of what your thinking has been because I don't know you as a guest lecturer. So I want to try something and see if it will work just to get some sense first on what your thoughts are on how you define development, which will help me know how to present post-development theory to you. So I don't know if any of you have done Slido before, which is um, an online polling system. If you know what to do, what you, what you can do is respond to this question of just what is development? What you do to join is you either can scan that little funny little, what do you call those things, QR code, or you can go to slido.com on your phone or your computer, and then you will be able to just answer the question and I will be able to see your answer. So if you're able to do that, can you do that? And then um, type it in, it will come up anonymously but I will be able to see your responses and you'll be able to see each other's responses and then I'll have some idea of what you think of how you would define development from what you've learned so far in the course. Okay, I see that there are some people who are there and are busy typing, so you can type them up and there's a, a well-being someone is saying, so someone understands development as well-being. Yeah, that's a very, um, 
a very broad and holistic way of thinking about development. Someone else is saying change for the better. So this is this idea of, of improving and, and making things um, better. That's definitely one of the terms that we associate often with development. Um, someone is saying economic growth. So there we have one of the terms that is a little narrower than well-being or change for the better, but that has been from the, from, um, the mid uh, 20th century very key to how we understand development. GDP growth, economic growth, it must be about um, countries becoming wealthier and um, growing their economies to become bigger. So what are some other ideas? Sustainability has come up there as well. And sustainability is often used as a kind of counter to economic growth. So I'm glad those two words now jump next to each other when they, um, so that sustainability is often seen that it, it should counter economic growth because economic growth can lead us to the situation that we have where there are big environmental problems as a result of, um, of all the economic growth. Now there's some more words coming up here, learning, social change, sustainable, better future, um, quality of life. What I'm noticing about all these words is they're all positives. They're all uh, really good things, right? Change for the better, sustainability, well-being. None of these things is something that you wouldn't want to have. And that's going to be very interesting as I'm going to move forward uh, to, to talk about post-development theory. So I'm just going to let, there's one more person that was typing there. I think now the new one that came up was progress, positive change. So here you can see all of these words. Now they're moving around to refine something. Um, and all of this idea of positive and improvement and good things. So what you, um, we will see is, and I think that um, I prepared the slide in advance, but you, you are confirming what I said there, that development is usually understood as a good thing. When you ask somebody what is development, it's seen as a positive, um, a very good thing, something that we desire and we want to have more of. But then you have the post-development critique, and what we're going to see is that that's post-development critique is actually quite negative about development. It's a radical critique of development that um, rose to prominence in the 1990s. Um, and there was a lot of debate about post-development theory in the 1990s, early 2000s. Since then, the debate has not been so heated, but it's gone off in lots of different directions. And there's still this bubbling concern about development and about um, the shortcomings of development. And so what post-development theory did is it insisted that we actually need to get rid of development and we need to call for alternatives to development rather than just trying to improve development. But as you can see, I mean, you've already put forward all the ideas that you're associating with development and that most people associate with development. Those are very positive ideas, positive change, um, improvement, progress, growth, all of these things seem very good. And so that's... Um, it's worth in exploring what do post-development theorists mean when they're saying that there are problems with development. And so in the beginning of this lecture, I'm just going to introduce you to some of the ideas of post-development theory. Firstly, some of the classic texts, and I, I suspect that you know some of these, especially I think I saw on your reading list, the one in the middle there, Encountering Development by Arturo Escobar. So that is one of the classic texts of um, post-development theory. Um, another one that's, uh, I think, the one that I first encountered when I was um, learning about post-development theory is the Development Dictionary, an edited volume by Wolfgang Sachs, which was re, uh, there was a, a second edition that came out um, about 10 years ago, I think. And then there's also the Post-Development Reader, also an edited text bringing together lots of um, post-development ideas and, and thinking. So I'd say those are three of the classic texts. There are others as well, but those are perhaps um, the, some of the texts that people go to as a starting point when learning about post-development thinking. But um, when thinking more recently about um, some of the texts more, that are more recent that uh, developed this worldview that post-development theorists began with, you can think of the Pluriverse book, Post-Development Dictionary, um, I asked, I was asked to give two texts for you to consider, and the, one of them that I gave, the text by Bassi, Nemo Bassi, is from that pluriverse book. Um, Arturo Escobar is still elaborating his ideas in different ways. He has several books, so Pluriversal Politics is one of the recent ones, where he now talks a lot about the pluriverse, but it's still um, 
very much in a similar vein to his, um, his ideas about post development theory. And then that um, the edited uh, volume on the development dictionary was actually first a edited journal issue. Uh, and that's where the article of mine that I've also sent through um, comes from that collection. So these are some more recent debates about post-development theory and post-development thinking. So um, if I try, I, I tried um, in the next few slides to just sum up some of the key points that post-development thinkers made. Um, and if I look at those, I would say one of the first ones, and this is expressed very nicely by Sachs in that post-development dictionary book, he says, um, development has failed. And he has this lovely quote where he says, the idea of development stands like a ruin in the intellectual landscape. Delusion and disappointment, failures and crimes have been the steady companions of development. And they tell a common story. It did not work. So this is the idea that comes across in a lot of post-development thinking is that they say, well, development failed. We have been talking about development and having development projects, and especially from the 1950s onwards, although the roots go back further. Um, and look, we still have a very divided world. We still call some countries underdeveloped and developing after uh, more than 50 years. And so it clearly doesn't work. The next thing that um, they, stress is that it's not simply a case that development doesn't work and we should be sad that it, it's you know that it has failed but that it's actually not even desirable so it's not that development doesn't um hasn't succeeded and now we should make it succeed but rather that we don't even want it to succeed and so the Bassi quote there says that the pursuit of development has promoted butchery on the african continent the notion that the path to development taken by others is what we must follow is essentially imperialist used to justify colonialism, neocolonialism, and neoliberalism. And Ranima calls development a poisonous gift. So that's what really sets uh, post-development thinkers apart from many other um, crit critics of development is most other critics say development has failed. So what we need to do is we need to do this other thing to make it, make it work. But post-development theorists say, we don't even want it to work. It's not desirable for it even to work. And part of the reason why it's not de desirable is because it's not possible. And so, for example, Sachs says that if all the countries were to follow the industrial example of the developed countries, then we would need five or six planets to serve as mines and waste dumps. So they point to the uh, environmental shortcomings related to development and say that now if we all have the same vision of development and we all want to um, develop, then that's just not possible because our planet cannot sustain that level of development. So one of the reasons why development is not desirable is that it's not, it's not possible even to achieve. So if it's failed, it's not desirable, it's not possible, then, you know, then the notion is, well, if, then we should, in, in fact, reject development because it's, it's not possible for it to be a success and we should not even desire that success. And so from this recent pluriverse um, book edited by Kotari and his colleagues, he says that despite these numerous attempts to resignify development, it continues to be something that experts manage in pursuit of economic growth and and they measure it using gross domestic products. So it's all about um, uh, economic growth, like one of you highlighted that is one of the meanings of development. And they see this as a poor and misleading indicator of progress in the sense of well-being. Um, and, um, so, and, they, and they reject this idea that the industrialized countries should serve as a beacon for the backward ones. So this is the, the idea that we should then reject development. And linked to the idea of rejecting development is this idea that we should embrace alternatives to development. And so um, here we, we have a, again a quote from Kotari et al. And that quote says that um, we, should, we should rather embrace transformative initiatives rather than reformist solutions. Um, because they are saying that you can't just fix development to reform it, but rather we should transform it. Um, and Demaria and Kotari talk about development term as a, as a toxic term that should be rejected. And my apologies, I am not in the office because we don't have electricity. 
And so I'm teaching this from my home and I'm in the entrance hall, but that is part of development is having electricity. And some of us, we don't always have e electricity everywhere. Um, and so this is then this idea that, you know, we development has failed, it's not possible, it's not desirable, let's embrace alternatives to development. That's the, the kind of, I would say, the, the narrative that you see with post-development theory. And then importantly, and very interestingly, I think, is that they look to the global south when wanting to find these alternatives. And this has been a feature of um, post-development theory. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you are, I know some of you are uh, situated in, in Brazil, but I know that also that some of the German participants are not German um, in that you're also international students. I don't know how many of you come from the global south. But post-development theory generally looks to the global south and to the, the so-called indigenous for inspiration. So um, when they say we need alternatives to development, those alternatives are not going to come from the global north. They're going to come from the global south or from marginalized communities in the global north. So for example, Acosta says we are witnessing an ever greater flourishing of alternative conceptions in many different parts of the world. Many of these alternative proposals originate from traditionally marginalized and exploited social sectors. And he says it's the indigenous people who in adverse conditions are striving to uphold their ancestral values, experiences, and practices. And Esteva also makes this comment about indigenous peoples having a long experience in dealing with modernity and being a source of inspiration for those imagining its end. So the, the view is that we should look to these alternatives. Where are those alternatives coming from? They're coming from the global south. And some examples, some that are often mentioned, one there that you can see on the right is Buen Vivir. Um, and it was interesting for me just searching these terms. When I look for images portraying these terms, I got a lot of these images of circles and unity, holding hands, bringing together. Um, so in this particular image there, you see the, the in Buen Vivir, the image there that should be on your right where it says Pueblos Diversos Unidad para Buen Vivir, people, um, diverse people united for a good life, holding hands together there with planet Earth uh, in this harmonious way. Um, so this notion of Buen Vivir, which means to live well or living well, um, is one of the, the notions that is being put forward as an alternative from the global south, such that rather than promoting development, we should promote Buen Vivir. Um, and then on the left there in the green, um, there's a, you might be interested in visiting the website. It's an Indian website that brings together all of these different alternatives that again, are people who are trying to do something that is an alternative to development that draws on different values that um, is supposed to be seen as something that is, is can, can be an alternative to development there in that vikalpsangam.org. And from where I come from in South Africa and um, also elsewhere in Africa, people often speak about Ubuntu. And so that image that I got there is taken from the South African Ubuntu Foundation. Again, it's a circle, people holding hands. You can see the similarities in the imagery here. And again, it's an alternative from the Global South. And I noticed that Ubuntu is often being referred to in um, some of the post-development writing about alternatives from the global south. It's often the African example that's um, added to perhaps Buen Vivir from, um, from South America. And then Swaraj is sometimes used from India and these different um, alternative concepts are supposed to now be inspirations for thinking about a different way to um, approach well, for an alternative to development, because these post-development thinkers seek to reject development and to advance these alternatives. So that is kind of a summary of post-development theory, but I want to just point out that like with any other um, approach to development, and I think you've been looking at other approaches to development, there are different strands, different connections. So, um, Post-development theory is kind of a label that's used for all of these radical critiques of development. But as you can see in the image um, I'm using there in the two blue ovals, I'm using a distinction that's taken from Ahamziai. 
And the distinction there is between a kind of radical democratic strand of post-development theory and what he calls a more neo-populist strand, um, which, is, uh, which he is more critical of. But you can see also that these strands connect with other ways of thinking about development. So um, for example, I don't know if you've thought a little bit about participatory development and about degrowth, how familiar you are with that thinking or about decolonial theory, about indigenous knowledge. You can see that these make connections with post-development theory in different ways. Um, but that um, post-development theory is not just one um, united, homogenous set of thinking. There's, it's, there's rather quite a lot of um, distinctions between different aspects and elements of post-development theory. Um, and so when we think about, when you think about your own position in relation to post-development theory, it might be that like ZI, you, you are very keen on the radical democratic strand, but not so keen on the neo-populist strand. By the neo-populist strand, he's talking about uh, people who want to reject development and favor a kind of um, preserving tradition. So it's more conservative, whereas the radical democratic strand tends to want to reject development, but then to allow people to develop their own alternatives rather than assuming that those alternatives will come out of existing traditions or existing practices. Um, and so he sees those as two different strands. So I'm about halfway through my presentation now, and I've given you the what post-development theory says. And so now what I'm wanting to now think through are what are the shortcomings? So I want to ask you first from your own reading and from what you've just listened to today, if you now have to give a critique, what's wrong with post-development theory? What's wrong with this perspective? I'd be interested if you can join, you do the same thing that you did last time, you either scan that little um, code or you can join. If you can't scan, you can join um, there by typing that number in. But I'm interested just from your, your own views, what the shortcomings are of post-development theory. I don't know, because I don't know what you've all already read. You might've read 56 different critiques or you might not have read any critiques and the first time you heard of post-development theory was today, fine. What do you think? What would you say is your, your first sense of what's wrong with post-development theory? What do you think um, is, is not good? Okay, so the first one that comes up is utopic. Yeah, so this idea we're gonna reject development, we're gonna come up with these alternatives and they're about buen vivir and, and uh, uh, Ubuntu, where we're all holding hands and protecting the earth and so on, is indeed you're, you're not the only one to say, yeah, utopia. Uh, it's idealistic, it doesn't really, um, it, it's not what, uh, it's not something that is likely to actually happen. I think that's what people mean. I assume that's also what you mean when you say utopic. And I see others are, 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 are busy coming up with their um, critiques. Okay, we see dependency and from the outside. Um, I'm not sure from the outside and dependency. Um, we'll, you know, when we have the longer discussion, it'll be interesting for me to hear on what you mean from the outside. Is the critique coming from the outside? Is the critique or, or what is the outside? That's the problem there. Um, dependency is perhaps, and there are different ways that you might mean this, but it, it is, how could you, in, in some ways, the global South is very dependent on the global North and it's difficult to break that dependency. And some of this kind of idea of let's leave development behind and come up with a radical alternative, there's a difficulty there in terms of how you address the dependency between the global north and the global south, which depend upon each other. Um, I like this comment here There it says why they can get there and I can't. So um, that is, is something I'm going to raise uh, a little bit later. So there's this idea of like, but they have a big house and a fancy car and all of these things. So why can't I have them? Why should I not have these parts of development? Um, so, yeah, I see they're hard to be achieved um, in the global south scenario. So oh, the theories coming from parts of the world who don't understand problems in other regions. Practical actions, there's no real answer on how to be competitive. 
and not having is sadly not valid because other countries will use their advantage. So I think some of you are being uh, rightfully skeptical. That's exactly what uh, uh, good stu students are is, is or what good readers are of any scholarly text. You should be quite um, skeptical and I'm seeing that skeptical of how would this happen in the global south really? And would people really accept these alternatives? Um, someone says their knowledge of tradition, for example, mixed with Christianity, this idea that people in the global south are all rooted in uh, these indigenous traditions that can serve as alternatives. Well, many people in the global south are not rooted in those traditions and indeed their traditions and practices and beliefs are very similar to people in the global north. Um, and so, yeah, there are all of these questions coming up. That's great. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I see there's still a few more coming in, but once those few have come out, I'm going to start to, to look th through what some of the critiques are that others have given, uh, which those critiques go very well with some of the of, of your critiques. Someone has just said there, will the rest of the world accept? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, if if some part of the world was to say, okay, we don't want to be part of this development project, we want to do something very different, we want to break away from it, um, because of our interconnected world and the way in which we depend on the resources and so on of, of other parts of the world, would, it, would that really even be acceptable? Um, and would it really be politically possible for a country to kind of de-link in the way that some post-development theorists seem to imply? And someone else there is saying that it's mostly just a critique of economic growth. Um, there have been plenty of critiques of economic growth. I'm sure, seeing as you've been reading different things on development, a lot of different scholars before post-development theory said, is development not all just about economic growth. It's also about human development, also about the environment. And so we've had approaches such as human development, sustainable development, endogenous development, alternative development, which try to bring in these different views. And there somebody also says that there's a loss of global voice if you diverge from classical views. Yeah, and that's important in that people, anyway, a lot of people want to be part of the global, the whole glo global world and be a member of that global community. Not everybody would be keen to lose that voice if you're now separating yourself off and following these traditions. So great, so you already have a number of great critiques here from, from classmates on um, post-development theory. And the last one is coming up here as well. Cultural diversity as a way to develop a necessary variety of different forms of understanding and creating. Okay, that could be almost in favor and against post-development theory. In favor is post-development theory says that, you know, we don't all want to be like the West. Everyone must follow the West example. Rather, post-development theory rejects that and says we should, um, that different parts of the world should embrace their own alternatives and do different things. So that increases cultural diversity. But at the same time, I think um, that you're, if you're presenting it as a critique, the critique there is that if everyone is doing all of these alternatives, then in a way you close yourself off from the rest of the world to some extent. So if in South Africa, we're going to follow an Ubuntu path and then maybe in uh, Ecuador, they're going to embrace Buen Vivir, then you know, you're going to separate uh, countries off and not have a way of connecting. So let's have a look at some of these critiques that have been given, some of the key critiques. So here I'm going to give you some of the critiques that have perhaps been most uh, prominent in terms of post-development theory. Um, well, the one critique is just that post-development theory homogenizes development. It treats development like it is just one Thing and it's all the same. So in those images that I have there, these are all images that can in some way relate to development. Maybe some people, when they think of development, they think of constructing a big dam to help with hydroelectric power or water supply. Somebody else thinks about urbanization and that big city or the skyscrapers. Someone else thinks about housing provision and the building of, a, of, of houses. Somebody thinks about um, big commercial farming, somebody else thinks perhaps about food gardens and small food gardens as pictured there where the man is growing a cabbage. Somebody might think of solar power and um, bringing electrification to small villages, all sorts of different things. So in a sense, when post-development theory says, no, we reject development, I think that um, some of the critics say, well, the only way to reject development is to kind of say that all development is about industrialization, economic growth, everyone becoming like the West. But 
development is so many different things. It's not just that it might be a food garden, it might be a solar panel. Does post-development theory really reject everything to do with development? And if it doesn't, then in a sense, it's like other crit critiques of development. It's not um, a complete critique of development. It's just, it's just wanting to improve it in some way. So that's one of the main critiques is just this kind of way that post-development theory makes development sound like it's just all one thing. Then um, some people also say the problem is that there's no clear alternative. So it's fine to say this is what's wrong with development. Development was uh, is about westernization, industrialization, it's environmentally damaging, and to put all of that critique. But then why is there no alternative articulated? It's important to articulate an, an alternative, and they, there was felt that post-development theory didn't articulate an alternative. However, the recent texts, like, are much better at articulating alternatives, at least um, alternative concepts and values, if not necessarily so much concrete examples. But certainly the early post-development theory was principally critique. And so that is one um, criticism that has been given. Another one is this idea that post-development theory romanticizes the poor or the non-Western or the indigenous. Um, so that was coming up with that idea that the, the very first critique that one of you put up, the utopic, that, that's this sort of thing, that post-development theory makes out like these alternatives, these non-Western alternatives are so perfect and so wonderful and everything is marvelous. Um, and so it kind of romanticizes um, people who are poor or non-Western or indigenous or who are poor, non-Western and indigenous. And um, the illustration that I have, there's one that irritates me very, very much as someone coming from South Africa, where we talk about Ubuntu. And when you search Ubuntu, you'll find this image all over the place. I couldn't find its origin, so I cannot attribute it to anyone because it seems to be all over the internet in different forms. And so there's the image there. I don't know if everyone can see of all of these children who don't seem to be wearing any clothes and they are all black African children and they're sitting in a circle. And then there's a little story, there are different versions, but the story, if you can't see it there, is that some anthropologist meets this group of people. Sometimes they call the Ubuntu tribe. No such tribe exists in Africa. And then he gives them, a, he says they must have a race and the winner gets a bowl of fruit or some sweets or something like that. And then the children refuse to um, like race. They rather all take the fruit together and they share because Ubuntu, they all want to share everything. and you know, anyone who, who, who lives in Africa will tell you like children here are like children elsewhere. They're probably going to um, not share all the sweets and they will probably want to, to um, they might behave differently. Not all children behave the same and different, uh, there are different norms in different spaces about how to share things. But uh, this is a kind of romanticized vision of how in Africa we always share everything. And um, so it's this sort of thing that people feel that post-development theory risks doing when it says we reject development and we embrace, embrace alternatives such as Ubuntu, Buen Vivir, uh, Swaraj, Suma Kausai, which is another uh, South American term similar to um, Buen Vivir that sometimes it's a kind of romanticization. It depicts these, um, these communities in a way that is, is not really uh, realistic to how they really are. And then another one, there are others, but these are just some that come up quite a lot, is the politics of post-development theory. And so the question there is that, um, is that post-development theory suggests that we reject development because development has failed and it's not desirable and it is uh, environmentally harmful. But then some of the critics say, you know, that if you reject development, what will you do about poverty and inequality? In what way do these alternatives that you're suggesting that should be built from the global south and drawing on indigenous concepts, how will they address poverty and inequality? And so some of the critics have felt that um, the politics of post-development theory is, is at fault because it kind of washes its hands of the poor in that it says um, that it says that, that we should no longer try to bring development to the poor. And um, people who are in favor of development feel that development is what will address poverty and inequality. 
I guess the post-development theorist's response would be to say, it has failed to do that. So development is not the answer. But the critic will say, well, you haven't provided us with a clear answer. Surely we should continue rather to try to promote development in order to address poverty and inequality. So I've given, you've come up with a few of your own uh, critiques and so you've identified some of the shortcomings of post-development theory. I've given you some others. Um, and what I'm, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna show you a few further images from um, Africa in particular to just think through, which, which I've been using to, to think through what does it mean to reject development and what does it mean to think about indigenous alternatives? So this first image is from my hometown. This is Makanda, South Africa. This is just uh, one or two kilometers from my house. And what you see here is a protest. In South Africa, we are sometimes called the protest capital of the world. And we have very many protests. In fact, when you listen to the news, you will hear nothing about the protests at all, unless they're very big and dramatic because they are such a commonplace occurrence. But when you listen to the traffic report, that is when you will hear about the protest because the person will say something like, in today's traffic report, please avoid this road because the traffic lights are out. And then please avoid the N22 because there's protest activity on the N22. And then they'll carry on about a truck broken down in this lane or whatever. So it's so routine that roads get blocked as part of protests. And those protests are very often about the issues that was on this man's t-shirt here, land, food, jobs, income grants, dignity. Um, less often will somebody come there with a poster saying, we want dignity. But by asking for those other things, people are insisting upon dignity of being treated like human beings. But at these protests, people typically want things that I think most of us would associate with development. So typically it's because maybe an area was promised electrification and did not receive the electrification. Or perhaps they were promised housing, state housing, and it did not materialize. Or the roads are damaged, or as has happened in my town, water, maybe for weeks there's no water. And then um, people have not, that, that is obviously a reason for people to protest. So what you see in, South Africa, and not only in South Africa and many other parts of the global south, is often people are protesting because they want inclusion in development. Um, and so implicitly, this doesn't sit comfortably with the idea of post-development theorists that development is not desirable, that people should reject development because it feels like protesters like the ones pictured here do not actually uh, they are protesting for development rather than against it. Of course, in South Africa, for example, and elsewhere, there are sometimes protests like, for example, where a mining company is going to damage the environment and people do not want the environment damaged. They will also protest that. So, the, but their protests are, are not typically anti-development. Let's put it that way. So that is the one thing I want to just bring into the discussion is what does it mean that people protest in favor of getting the things we would usually associate with development. Then this picture is from a very terrible incident. The picture here is coming from the Melilla Morocco border. So um, at the top of Morocco is the small enclave that's actually part of Spain. And it is um, cut off by these many high fences that you can see in the background to try to prevent migrants from crossing over because they want to cross into Spain to claim asylum. And this is taken from an incident this year. These are mostly Sudanese men, and it's almost only men. And um, it's not clear what number of them died, but more than 20 died in trying to cross over this um, fence. They got crushed at a particular point um, in trying to, to cross over. But this is one example of many where the global south and the global north come into contact in this way. Usually when that happens, there are big walls and big fences like Trump was trying to build his wall. But in some other spaces where there is not a sea to separate people, then big um, other kinds of barriers are put up. But people from the global south often place their lives at risk 
to try to access the global north, to try to get into the, the, the global north. And what this kind of implies is a desire for the lifestyle and the goods that people have in the global north. And so again, I think it acts in some ways as something of an implicit critique to post-development theory or something that post-development theory has to think about. So what does it mean that people are willing to place their lives at risk like these young men in order to access the global north? What does that mean for thinking about development um, and for thinking about post-development or the rejection of development? And then there's this image. And well, here's two images. At the top is an image of a, a hut in Lesotho, a, a typical Basotho hut. Um, Lesotho is a small country in Southern Africa. It's actually enclosed in South Africa. And that is a kind of traditional hut in Lesotho. Below it is, a, I just try to find a kind of a typical house in the US, in this American house. And this relates to a conversation that um, I discussed in the article that I shared with you between James Ferguson, an American anthropologist, and a man who he calls Mr. Lebona, who is a man from Lesotho. And in this conversation, James Ferguson is talking to Mr. Lebona, and James Ferguson is saying how great the Basutu huts are. They're built from local materials, they're environmentally friendly, they are good for the weather in Lesotho, which is very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter, so they're environmentally appropriate. And so he's praising the Basutu hut. But Mr. Lebona is having none of that. And so Mr. Lebona says, James Ferguson puts it like this, he says, looking me carefully in the eye, Mr. Lebona asked, what kind of house does your father have there in America? Is it round? No, I confessed it was rectangular. Does it have a grass roof? No, it does not. Does it have cattle dung for a floor? No. And then how many rooms does your father's house have? Here I had to stop and think, which Mr. Lebona appeared to find amazing as rectangular houses in his experience had either two or three rooms. Finally, I mumbled about 10, I think. After pausing to let the sink in, he said only, that is the direction in which we would like to move. So Ferguson quotes this to try to, he, he, this, he's quoting this in his book, Global Shadows, I think, which he wrote many years after this incident. This incident happened when he was doing his research in, I think, the early 90s um, in Lesotho. And he is, um, he was thinking at that time, you know, this is, at that, at that time, he, um, Ferguson's early texts are even sometimes thought of as post-development theory. He himself was very critical of development, but these particular, this kind of interaction that he had with people like Mr. Lebona and others gave him pause. And he was trying to understand why does Mr. Lebona want to build himself a brick house with a tin roof that is bigger than the traditional Basutu hut? Why does Mr. Lebona want that? And that's something Ferguson tries to think about. Here is some recent research I've been doing with two of my graduate students. Um, we've been just asking people, what is development and do you want it? Because we want to know, okay, so what do, what do ordinary people think development is? How do they respond to development? And so we've been, the graduate um, researchers have been looking mostly at fairly marginalized communities, so rural communities, uh, one informal settlement, and a small kind of peri-urban area. And we've, there are about 70 interviews, but everyone wanted development. Nobody said, no, I don't want development. Everyone was key. And this is the kind of response that they give. So the one when asked about development, he says, it's that nowadays there is freedom. We are now free. As we are free now, we do not do things like the olden days. In the olden days, we were reliant on farming and reliant on plowing, whilst we were not here in the locations. The locations is like the, uh, urban areas where sort of the peripheral urban areas where black people were forced to live and still mostly live. And then it happened that because now there is development, he says, we came to this place that, they, that he's in now to make our homes there and try to develop our lives. And now we have electricity that we have received through democracy. We have water and toilets. And these things, electricity, water, toilets, roads, schools came up a lot in people's discussion of what they understand by development. 
And then this other person says, we use the name Ichichuko to explain development. The standard of life is developed because there are things that we have now that we didn't have back then. Back then we didn't have electricity. We used to draw drinking water from the streams and sharing them with cows. The tarred roads were far from us and we had to fetch stuff using donkeys and horses. There's now an improvement to the standard of living. So again, there's this idea that we, have, we now have good accessible water, electricity, and that is development and development is something that we desire. So to finish, I just want to give you two quotes and four questions to kick the discussion off. So when we think about post-development theory, when reflecting on it, um, Wolfgang Sachs, when he wrote the preface to the second edition of the Development Dictionary, he says, it is striking that we had not really appreciated the extent to which the development idea has been charged with hopes for redress and self-affirmation. It certainly was an invention of the West, as we showed at length, but not just an imposition on the rest. On the contrary, as the desire for recognition and equity is framed in terms of the civilizational model of the powerful nations, the South has emerged as the staunchest defender of development. So he's a post-development critic and he thinks development is bad. If we shouldn't want it, we shouldn't have the whole world becoming developed. But he notes that those who are defending development most striving are actually from the global South because development has been charged with the idea of redress and self-affirmation. Although ultimately he still holds that development is not a good thing. And then um, James Ferguson, who is talking about these kind of ideas like Mr. Lebona wanting to, in a way, copy the kind of house that they have in the US or in the West. And he says that claims of likeness in this context constitute not a copying, but a shadowing, even a haunting, a declaration of comparability, an aspiration to membership and inclusion in the world, and sometimes also an assertion of responsibility. So the idea that he's trying to get across there is that he, he wants to say in, that he, his respondents who he's speaking to, mostly um, Southern African respondents, are, seem to be wanting to have what the West has, but the way he interprets that desire is that it's an insistence of a common humanity of that, why should you have those things and us not? I think one of you put that as one of the critiques of post-development theory, this kind of idea of like, well, if you got that, why can't we have that? Why should we have things that you, why shouldn't we also have what you have? Um, and by making that kind of claim, it's a claim of comparability, of common membership, and of a desire to be part of a global world rather than a desire to live a different kind of life separate from the rest of the world. So to come, I want to put up four questions just to kick off the discussion. And these are the four questions. And they are, um, okay, bye-bye. Um, the first question is, when people say that they want development, what do you think that they mean? Um, so when we spoke to, I think we did about 70 interviews with people asking them, do you want development? What do you think of development? They were all saying, yes, we want development. This is what we think development is and so on. What do you understand? What do you think people understand by development? Um, some people feel that people's desire for development shows that their mind has been colonized. They want to be like the West because their minds have been colonized. What do you think of this idea? It's an idea that I critique in the article that I, I shared with you. What does this desire for development mean for the call for indigenous alternatives? So if we want to embrace indigenous alternatives like Ubuntu, Buen Vivir, but then people are saying we, feel, we want development, can these fit together or are they in tension with each other? And what does it generally mean for the critique of development if um, post-development theorists provide this critique and, and point out all the problems with development, but um, what does this desire for development mean for that critique? So what I, was, what I want to suggest is that we use the breakout rooms maybe for five minutes to just start talking about these, these, um, these different uh, questions. And then we come back and we'll have a bigger whole group discussion, but um, apparently you have breakout rooms and groups that you're already busy with. So I don't know if you just want to maybe just take a screenshot or whatever of these questions so that you have the, the questions. But it's also okay if you go off from these questions and just talk in general about post-development theory and the critiques of it. I don't mind um, how you, you do it, but um, if you can just 
do that maybe for five minutes or so in the breakout rooms. And then when you've had that smaller discussion, then you can share your ideas in the, in the bigger space. And I'm happy to ask, answer any questions and, and so on. Okay, welcome back. So um, now it's time for questions, comments, discussion. Um, I, I think what the suggestion is, is that you use the raise hand um, function. But if anyone has problems with that, you could put something in the chat. But if you want to use the little, uh, this little hand um, function like that, then I will know who would like to, to speak and then I can hear what you'd like to say. So who is wanting to start? That's interesting. I think a concept like development and any uh, big concept like democracy or justice is one that should be a contested concept. So it should be one that not everybody agrees uh, has a single meaning. And so I think that the role of education should be to get people to be aware of different perspectives and to be able to debate and consider them rather than say to educate people, this is what development is. Do, do you know what I mean? And sometimes they, yeah, there are um, approaches to thinking about development that tend to uh, be about, um, especially in the global South sometimes, that the idea was that we should educate people to bring development for the nation. And um, then that view sometimes doesn't want to be open to contestation. Um, so I think it's better to have an open view and it's, it's good to have those alternative perspectives being presented and to hear the critiques and to have a variety of views. I think, you know, when you look at the post-development critique, I think it's actually a critique of the, of industrialization and um, economic growth, rampant economic growth. And um, it's not, I, I don't think anybody thinks that people should not have access to healthcare and live longer. But then I think that sometimes that needed, needs to be spelled out clearly. So when people are saying something like development was a poisonous gift to the population, what do they mean? Do they mean uh, clean drinking water that comes into your house is a poisonous gift? Or do they mean um, encouraging people to desire to have a, ever a bigger house and a bigger car? You know, I think the critique was of the former, but that most people in the global south, hmm, I think people in the, in the global south want different things. Of course, people want the things like healthcare and a long life, but many people also want a, a big car and dream of things that um, in fact cannot be universalized. We cannot have everybody uh, living the kind of lifestyle that the rich in the US live because that is environmentally not a possibility at all. And so the post-development critique is, is helpful in trying to delegitimize that vision. Um, but then, you know, then there's the problem of like, what about the person who says, we used to have to go to the river and get water and it was dirty, we shared it with cows. We're very pleased now because there's a tap and, you know, it, it seems like you can't reject that. So I think there needs to be some nuancing on what are we trying to, what do we mean when we, when we say that we want or don't want development? Yeah, I think that the, this decolonizing of the mind thing is a very interesting discussion, even beyond development. Um, what I suppose, what I take exception to is where somebody from the global north who is advocating alternatives says that people in the global south 
who want to live like the West need to decolonize their minds because I feel like it's not their place to to say that. I think the peop- someone who calls for the decolonization of the mind in a sense has to be somebody who's coming from the group of people who experienced that colonization. So they are saying, we must decolonize our minds, not you must decolonize your mind, if, if, you, know, if you know what I mean. So I think um, I agree with your vision of that decolonizing the mind should be um, something that we are thinking about um, finding ways for people to define for themselves what they would like and not to accept the goals imposed upon them by others. But it, it still becomes quite difficult because even within a um, even within a country, if the leaders in the country say, well, we are promoting this alternative, say Buen Vivir, which has been promoted formally by some governments in South America, we're going to promote this alternative because we don't want to rely on the West and we want to have our own vision and we want to do, in a sense, decolonize our mind. But perhaps other communities within that same country don't agree with their vision. So, you know, there's, there's still a question of who has the authority to, to decide on the vision for how for people's lives. And I, I think it's very good for um, leaders in the Global South to articulate alternative visions, provided they are open to those visions being critiqued and contested by their population rather than to come a bit like the style of Mobutu in the in Zaire when he wanted authenticity, this kind of a, a, a drive that everybody living in the country had to um, throw off, for example, their Western names and they had to embrace, uh, they had to come up with, they had to have an indigenous name. He was using it as a kind of cover for his other political goals, but it was an authoritarian form of decolonizing the mind rather than an open one. But I think what you're proposing, David, sounds like a much more um, promising and open-ended form of decolonizing the mind. So um, that's a big question and um, not when I fully I have the expertise to answer in terms of health. Um, it's, I think they're they really complicated reasons why countries don't have the national capacity to um, address the, the health problems of their population. And what is the ex- the explanation for Zimbabwe might be different from the explanation for, say, Malawi, and each one will have a different explanation. But what you do see, which I think ties in with what you're saying, and which is worrying, is the the increased role of um, of big uh, non governmental actors, which um, provide healthcare. And but which have a very strong influence then in determining health policy within poorer countries. And it's not just it's so it's not just international actors like World Health Organization, but actually these um, non-governmental organizations, whether it's Médecins Sans Frontières or whether it's something like the Global Fund, which funds a lot of um, healthcare initiatives in Africa. But then with that funding comes power to determine who should get healthcare and how healthcare should be provided and along with that power doesn't come much accountability because the actors that are providing um, the care are actors that are not that are very difficult for people to hold account to hold accountable so i think that part of part of whatever kind if one is to understand development in a positive way you have to understand it as addressing dependency i know there was one of the things that somebody brought up when we did those little um slido questions Somebody mentioned dependency. I don't know if it was you or somebody else, but and I wasn't sure what they meant in terms of it as a critique for post-development theory. But I think that um, 
that at a minimum we, we should want a country to to be able to make its own decisions about about healthcare and about other matters and not to have those decisions determined from outside. Um, and it's when, but when a country has um, the kinds of problems that countries like Zimbabwe have, then almost inevitably they will end up um, dependent on outside actors. Yes, so I suppose one of the things post-development theorists want to do is they want us not to be dependent upon the concepts that come from the West. And so part of the whole idea of post-development theory is search for these indigenous concepts like Buendivir or Ubuntu to bring them in as alternatives is because they feel like when you are, when the model is a model that is um, determined from outside that that model is not going to be appropriate. Um, so that's part of the debate is, I mean, it's a question also of what it means, what does dependency mean? Does dependency just mean that, um, does getting rid of dependency just mean having local decision makers? Does it mean local goal setting? Does it mean local conceptualization? Um, same with the question that David asked earlier around decolonization of the mind. Does that just mean is the emphasis on who gets to make the decisions and who gets to drive the agenda, or is it about the content of the agenda so that the content should be different and unique and draw on the local context rather than being inspired from afar? And I think there's that tension that post-development theory tends to pay quite a lot of attention to the content and not so much attention to the agency in terms of who's in charge, while others might say that development is um, a meaningful goal, provided that those who determine the agenda, like you're suggesting, um, are, are local, that the agendas are driven from outside. But even then, I mean, what does it mean? Does that mean uh, any, any South African actor can determine the agenda for South Africans because you know even within a particular community they're going to be those who dominate and those who um, whose perspective is not heard. So it's not enough to simply say, well, it shouldn't be people from the West or it shouldn't be um, people from outside a country, even within a country. There'd be questions of who who's determining the agenda. Okay, I think that um, post-development theorists would see ca the capabilities approach um, as being a kind of reformist approach to development and the post-development critique is, uh, presents itself as more radical. So that Sen's approach, which and, and Sen was a kind of architect of the idea of human development and the development of the, the human development index as an alternative to, to just using GDP growth. Um, but I think you can see that those those notions, in a sense, they um, built on, broaden, nuance the idea of development um, that existed, but they don't um, critique it as radically, I would say, as the post-development critique. I, I think they're points of contact, but I think the post-development critique is a more radical one that is questioning the very values, the very idea of development, the very idea that there can be a sort of, that we could create an index to measure everybody in the world because that implies that there's one sort of common goal for everyone and one common measure and they're much more into the idea of there being, of each community determining its own goals and perspectives. That's why the study of the pluriverse comes in, it's, it's much, um, it's much more aimed at having a lot of different alternative ways of thinking. 
I think if that answers your your question. I see there's a question in the chat. If I just read it, uh, Luisa says, my group of creative economy was debating the misconception of development because they demand basic needs, housing, water, electricity, hygiene, healthcare, and food, and also awareness of uh, and also awareness the output of this development is poverty and inequalities. So the discussion is to delegitimize and decolonize what way they pursue that. So alternative forms beyond capitalism, other types of politics like prefigurative forms and innovative methodologies that could fit this notion of post-development. Could you give some examples? Yeah, so I think if I'm understanding you correctly, Luisa, is that, so you're saying maybe that people want things like meeting their basic needs and housing, water, electricity, but at the same time, when they want these things that they see as part of development is actually uh, trying to achieve those things and to pursue development is ultimately part of the problem that results in the poverty and inequalities. I don't know if I'm understanding you. Yes, okay. And so, um, so you're suggesting so that how can one delegitimize and decolonize what way people seek to pursue that? So especially that they don't seek to pursue capitalism, but rather alternative um, paths for meeting those basic needs. So uh, if I understand you correctly, then, I mean, I don't think anyone can critique, uh, can disagree that it's reasonable for people to want to, to have adequate housing, water, um, if not electricity, then at least some, you know, some way of um, easing our lives by having heating and having efficient ways to prepare food, um, healthcare, opportunities and possibilities in life. But um, it might be that what people imagine will best bring them that is not actually what will bring them that. And also what people, um, I know some of you define development as well-being, for example. Sometimes people, what people imagine will bring them well-being is not really what will bring them well-being. Um, and so that is where these kind of um, alternatives could come in. Um, you're asking me for examples. Um, I know that um, some of the post-development theorists give examples. Um, that website that I gave, that I put in the presentation, the Bikalp Sangam website uh, that's called something mm -hmm. like the Confluence. Um, but uh, the presentation can be, be shared. There are some um, alternatives that some people are talking about and are articulating. But mm -hmm. what we also see, if you look, for example, with um, the initiatives around Buen Vivir in Latin America, um, is that sometimes what ends up, once a program gets adopted by government or an NGO, whether they're calling it development or they're using an alternative term, often it ends up being pretty much like other development projects. Do you, do you know what I mean? Especially once it gets kind of um, taken up by the by powerful actors, they will also um, adapt it and change it in, in certain ways. So I think a lot of what seems to be most important and what seems to be shared by both post-development thinkers and some other critics is just an emphasis that there should be open-endedness, that there should be uh, democratic forms of participation so that people can contest um, both the idea of development and also the path to getting there that there should not be a closing off. Um, and also the point that some of you have raised around dependency, that they shouldn't be, that people should have the agency to be able to act um, oh rather gosh. than being dependent on outside actors. I'm not at all an expert in public health. So I, I don't have any kind of good solution for how to address healthcare issues. I think when you ask, is it linked in some way to colonialism, Africa's problems now with healthcare? 
um, any problem that people have, you have to trace back the history of how that problem emerges. And so certainly they would be um, part of the cause of the problem that we, problems we have today will certainly be from colonialism and from whatever inequalities were set up in the colonial era. But that's not the only, there will be other causes. And I think they might be quite distinct from one country to another. I mean, one big problem that Africa faces is just that a lot of healthcare workers leave. And that is partly because we have a, a, a global world. Often they are leaving to go to the former colonial power or to another um, uh, Anglophone, people from Anglophone countries will go to another Anglophone country. Um, but this is very difficult to figure out how you would stop that or to, to say that it is not possible for people to leave a country if they want to should should um, rich countries compensate poorer countries when they take their healthcare workers because the poorer country trained that healthcare worker. So there are questions around that. Um, but honestly, I don't think that one can say this is how to address healthcare in Africa. I think that um, one has to look at specific countries and specific cases and so, this is why we, we, we need research that I'm sure perhaps some of you might be able to do because the answer of what to do in Ghana might be different from the answer of what to do in Nigeria and even the answer of what to do in northern Ghana might be different from southern Ghana and so on. So I think it's very difficult to come up with a general solution. There. I'm sorry, that's not very helpful. Hopefully, Bora, maybe I have a more helpful answer to your question. I, su I suppose, um, I mean, there are countries that have changed their fortunes um, all the time. So it is certainly possible globally, we see that you will have a country where a certain proportion of people live in poverty and then they will, that that will decrease. I mean, we see, we see most notably with the, the biggest example at the moment is China, which has now far fewer people that were poor than, than before. Um, it is indeed difficult to do that if you don't have some kind of resources or some way of um, enabling your population to be able to produce more or to uh, distribute those goods in a different way. Um, and so again, I, 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 I know this is maybe a terrible answer that I'm giving that is a bit the same as the answer I gave to the previous question. And that is just that they, there isn't really one answer that one could make generally for um, all the different countries in that one country's particular route might be very different from another country's. Some countries might be able to use the resources that they have to kickstart a process that might be able to um, improve people's lives. Other countries might have to rely on a different kind of path. I think what's also um, needed in Africa anyway is some degree of working together as different African countries because um, many of the countries are in some ways not the way that countries were cut up often does not have to do with um, economic or political viability because the states came in, were formed by, um, in line with colonial intentions and logics at the Berlin conference. And so sometimes um, it's very difficult for a country that would not have come about if it could only come about as a viable political or economic entity, but now it, it, it exists. It's very difficult for it to, to, to change things within that country on its own. And so there's also a need for cooperation between different countries, especially the smaller, more marginal countries. Um, I think there's also a need just for careful research, which is something that those of you who are getting the education that you're getting can do. 
um, there's this interesting econo economist, I forget their names now, who wrote the book Poor Economics. And what they do is they're doing these, ti these tiny, many, many little small research projects to determine what helps address malaria in this place at this time, and then see if that will work somewhere else. But in a way, you know, the answer to how to address say malaria in one place is not necessarily the same as addressing it somewhere else. And so that deep research and sharing of ideas is needed to, to, to improve things rather than a kind of one size fits all model. And that's part of, if we round off and finish, I mean, that's part of the post-development critique of development was that development is this big idea that is not supposed to be valid for everywhere and all time. And in fact, um, we need to take into account more the, the kind of local specificities in terms of people's concepts, in terms of how people would like to live their lives. Um, and we need to feed that back into a discussion of what we, of how we want to imagine development, um, rather than thinking that one model of how to organize a society is valid for the whole world. So perhaps if we end with that, <laughs> Thank you. You've asked me some very difficult questions and sorry, especially the ones on healthcare. I haven't been very able to answer, but um, sh I, I look forward to the research that will come out from, from you in a few years time that might answer some of those questions.